The American workplace has been changing, not just in terms of design and technology innovations, but also in terms of people. Today's workforce includes a wider age range and greater ethnic diversity than ever. And real estate is at the center of everything that comes together. On this episode, we explore the office as a multi-generational melting pot with members of CBRE's Hispanic Employee Networking Group, also known as OLA, voices from one of the nation's fastest growing cultural forces. My parents, for example, they risked their lives coming here without knowing how to speak a word of English, crossing the borders, slaving away in a hundred degree heat for decades. And ultimately, they built their very own successful business. So why not carry on that legacy of hard work and determination? That's Nellie Cruz, a member of Generation Z and the youngest of our guests on this show. Specializing in landlord and occupier representation, Nellie is part of CBRE's office advisory team in her hometown of Sacramento. As it relates to my heritage, early in my career, I found a way to really leverage my differences, right, my strengths. And that's Pedro Nino, a proud millennial who is vice president and head of industrial research at Clarion Partners, a firm with more than $80 billion of assets under management. Pedro began his real estate career with CBRE back in 2013. Now he joins us from Clarion's office in Dallas. And our final panelist is its elder statesman, Armando Nunez. Armando is a New York-based senior vice president in CBRE's Global Corporate Services Group and a Gen Xer, like me, who's currently in his 30th year at the company. When you're running cross countries, like, you know, the, the worst thing you can do is say, oh, I feel tired. You know, it's, it's more about taking on more. And I think that sort of approach that I got from my father was how I approach real estate. And as an added bonus, we hear from some other important voices as well. Namely, a remote audience from Ola, who we invited for a behind-the-scenes experience of the show. Bienvenidos a todos. They sent in some great questions of their own, and we get to as many as possible during our time on the air. Coming up, personal experiences and advice for navigating a career in an ever-evolving business landscape. A special episode to commemorate Hispanic Heritage Month with the voices of generations in the workplace. I'm Spencer Levy, and that's right now on The Weekly Take. Welcome to The Weekly Take, and this week I'm delighted to be celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month with three great uh, leaders within our industry. First, Pedro Nino. Pedro, thanks for joining the show. Hola, Spencer. Un fuerte abrazo a todos mis amigos de CBRE. Thank you, Pedro. And then we have our colleague, uh, Nellie Cruz. Nellie, thanks for joining the show. Hi, everyone. I'm very excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Delighted to have you, Nellie. And then Armando Nunez. Thanks for joining the show. Great to be here. Awesome to see so many folks on this call. Terrific. Hello to my friends at Ola, and we're going to have a lot of fun today. But let's start with the nuts and bolts of just office in the workplace. Pedro, you're back in the office. Um, how's it going? I am in the office today, and I would say that I'm, I'm probably regularly about four days a week. Um, and, and I think that the last two years, if there's something we've learned, is that we can be effective when working remotely. You know, hybrid has been an experiment that we've all tested, and I think we've come away with great takeaways on how to make it work. But at the same time, um, I, I truly do believe that being you know, on the sort of lower end to the mid end of my career I really do believe that being visible, being present is which one of the reasons why I come in more than potentially required at the moment. Being present is important for you know, establishing your personal brand, right? For collaborating, for working with my team, for being more visible, et cetera. And, uh, and related to that, I'll share a funny story um, or just a story that actually happened to me. But a year ago, I poked my head into our office before we were all coming in more frequently because I had to pick up something from my desk. And while doing that, I ran into a senior colleague that actually said to me, hey, now that you're back at work, I've been wanting to meet with you regarding something. And that just absolutely exploded my mind because within industrial, we've been extremely busy, certainly over the last cycle, but over the last couple of years. So I truly believe that face-to-face and and in office is is tremendously important. Nelly, I would love to get your experience as well about, are you in the office today and how's it been going getting back there? 
Yeah, I, I have to agree with Pedro. I am in, also in the office about four to five days a week. Um, I like to say that I'm a little bit religious to it because if it wasn't for the office, uh, I wouldn't have all the opportunities that I had. Uh, I started in, in late 2018, and the actual reason how I started was I had an interest in commercial real estate, had an interest in CBRE, and one day I decided I'm just going to walk into our downtown Sacramento office and see if there are any job opportunities available. Had the office been closed, that wouldn't have been a possibility. So one day I walked in and I handed my resume over and they said, somebody's here and they're willing to meet with you right now. And I said, well, that's great. I'd love to. Um, so I was interviewed on the spot and then I was invited to be interviewed again uh, two times after that and ultimately was hired on into our research department where I met so many fantastic people, was there for a year, and then I was recruited onto our office leasing and sales team in our office. And I just think if it wasn't for those opportunities to see everybody face to face, and essentially I cold called my way into my dream career, um, I wouldn't be here today. I think I would be backtracked. I think I would be delayed in what my goals were. Armando, what's been your experience for the same thing, getting back to the office? For me, the pressure was on uh, our corporate leaders to communicate with us while we're remote. So I, I really think during this uh, pandemic, the communication and the knowledge sharing that's coming in from CBRE and leaders and even, you know, your weekly take, Spencer, they've been fantastic. I, I feel like I've learned so much more during this um, and I've been here 30 years. So it's always great uh, to see how our corporate leaders have stepped up in knowledge sharing. So let's now talk generationally. And let's start with you, Nellie. Uh, what a wonderful story um, of how you got here. Uh, but you are at the beginning of your career. Um, how does somebody at the beginning of their career deal with what we're dealing with today, uh, the post-pandemic era? And what advice would you give people that are in your career cohort? Gosh, the one thing I would say was would be to always pursue your dreams and aspirations without hesitation. Because commercial real estate is a lot of learning and experience, as any career is. But just take the chance. Our parents, uh, speaking on behalf of the Hispanic community and the diverse communities, uh, or past generations, they came to this country for a better future for themselves and for their children. And we shouldn't take that for granted. Uh, my parents, for example, they risked their lives coming here without knowing how to speak a word of English, crossing the border, slaving away in a hundred degree heat for decades. And ultimately, they built their very own successful business. So why not carry on that legacy of hard work and determination? We have all the opportunities laid out in front of us, and it's up to us to take the initiative and take those on and supersede all the expectations that have been preset. Pedro, as you stated, you're a little bit more advanced in your career than Nelly. Um, I'm not just going to go so far to say mid-career because even though Armando and I are about the same vintage, I'm still rocking and rolling for another 20, 30 years, man. But nevertheless, <laughs> since we are classifying yeah. you as mid-career, how do you see your generation, your stage of your career, and advice you would give others? Yeah, I'll start with the advice part. Um, I would say there's probably two points of advice that I would, I would want to give myself and give future generation of Hispanics that are looking to do potentially the same thing that I'm doing now. And the first one is, most important, is get yourself a mentor. Right? Get yourself a mentor early in your career. I've had several mentors at different stages of my careers that have helped me grow, you know, both professionally and personally. And having someone in your corner that can give you advice, that can give you guidance, and sometimes criticism, right? That can walk you back or tell you, hey, you're doing something wrong. That can be very important. You know, when I first started my career, um, I started as a research coordinator. And at the time, that was the, sort of the most entry level within research within the team. But I still built the courage to ask one of our senior directors if they could be my mentor, and then when I moved to San Antonio, I did the same with a senior industrial broker. And to this day, I've benefited so much from our relationships and what we've learned together. And then the second part of that is don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to put yourself in uncomfortable situations because those situations will help you grow. You know, raise your hand to participate in a bigger project. Sit in big, important meetings, even if you're the only Hispanic there, right? And if you get stuck doing something you don't like, you know, do it and do it well. And chances are, if you do it very well, you won't do it for long. Armando would love to get your perspective. And as I said, you may be considered the later in your career person, but I'm telling you, we're just warming up, right, Armando? I am in my uh, seventh inning stretch right now. But for me, I think the, the voice of, if I could say my generation, really, if I had to share some advice would be, 
the folks that have been here for a while, I think they have a lot of wisdom and more importantly, a lot of contacts. And I think that's important that we share those as we develop because there's a lot of young people that I get involved with and uh, being uh, a leader of the Hispanic Scholarship Fund and also leading OLA has been tremendous. And I can share that wisdom and the knowledge because I don't think too much has changed over the years in terms of the fundamentals. I think our research has gotten better. Our tools to get that research has been better. So I think that's all good. But in terms of making sure you reach out to the folks that have been there and have experienced, I think that's important. Let me dig into that just a little bit deeper, Armando. How would you recommend that people approach somebody that they don't really know that well, but has that experience? Well, I, I think it's in your office. It's the, the person sitting right next to you, right? And that's establishing meaningful relationships. And, you know, we talk about mentors, and some of my mentors have been a little bit more casual in nature, but you know, they, they go back to my cross-country coach in high school who, you know, his, his slogan was work, suffer, win. And that he was an older man that had a lot of experience and had a lot of life. And that just all translates to me as hard work, self-sufficiency and optimism. I think that's important and you you can only get it for someone that's been around for a while. Now let's shift and we're starting to get some questions in from the audience and keep them coming, folks. Our first question comes in here from Liz Atley. I appreciate Liz uh, breaking the ice, but this is to you, Nellie. Uh, Nellie, as a Latina woman, how did you overcome the cultural bias of being the, quote, quiet woman? La mas quieta, la mas bonita. La mas quieta. (laughs) Great question. Uh, Art culture is for generations and still today uh, has to be one of the most conservative ones. Our parents were brought up with the ideals that the women have to be in the household and they have to be well behaved, um, which is all good. And it teaches you morals and it teaches you how to be a great person. Uh, But I largely attribute how I was able to get outside of that box of being the quiet one. Um, Thanks to my own mom, she was the leader of our family and she just always got out there and would negotiate with all of the people that she'd be negotiating with in part because of their business. And she'd be leading the conversation the entire time. Gosh, I wasn't even 10 years old. I was probably between five and 10 years old when she'd pick me up from school and we'd go door to door and drop off brochures of their business uh, in order to gain new clients. I think her example really broke out of that cultural bias and she was never afraid to have those obstacles. Well, that's great. To this day, I take my kids to the office. I take my daughter to several events. I've taken my son to several events. I think that's just a wonderful experience. So Pedro, uh, playing on the same theme of cultural or other differences with a Hispanic background? Has that changed your experience in the workplace? Yeah. So, you know, as it relates to my heritage, early in my career, I found a way to really leverage my differences, right? My strengths. And that was, one of those was being bilingual, right? I was working in in an office in the U.S. in El Paso, Texas with a great team, but we'd also do business quite a bit with clients and folks that were, you know, had portfolios not in the U.S., but also in Mexico. So what I did is I leveraged some of that. And what I did is even early in my career, I was able to get in front of high profile institutional clients, right? And at the same time, I was working with leadership from Latin America to help elevate the quality of reporting because standards in Latin America were slightly different than they were in the U.S. at the time. And getting involved with, you know, head of head of research for Latin America, et cetera, that just helped really propel my career. And again, just being able to leverage those differences. On the flip side, because obviously some of these conversations lead to maybe less comfortable conversations, right? I mean, I don't think I've ever been um, or felt disadvantaged by being Hispanic. I've been fortunate enough to be surrounded by good leaders and good teams. And because of that, I don't think I've ever felt like, you know, my ethnicity was a disadvantage. And I've been fortunate to do that. I mean, the reality is, as an industry, we're lacking, right? Only 6% of of commercial real estate professionals are Hispanic, right? Only 3% are senior leaders, And within that, Hispanic women only make up 1% of leaders in the industry as well. So maybe those that may follow may not be as fortunate as I am. But from my perspective, I was able to learn how to leverage my differences. And I was able to, um, again, surround myself with a great team that was instrumental in my success. 
I would say that the opportunities now for Latinos within real estate have never been better. And I, I think we're seeing that the numbers that are being put out that, you know, the growth is there, the opportunity for growth is there. So that means uh, as the Latino uh, you know, population, uh, we morph into what we have in the United States. It's only an opportunity for growth. And I see as our numbers, as Pedro pointed out, they're low right now. But that to me just means there's a lot of potential. All I see is the graph going up. So I think that's important. And um, I think some of these mentorships that you have early in your career, uh, similar to Pedro, I, I was doing projects internationally as well. And just being a bilingual led me to do, you know, a, a project in Mexico, led me to do projects across the globe as well. That's all been uh, part of the leverage of being um, a Latino in real estate. Let's now go to another question that came in from uh, somebody who didn't identify themselves, but it's also to you, Nelly. It says, Nelly, uh, do you find yourself toning down your uh, Latin dad, uh, I guess the, the word, in the workplace? What's your point of view? I myself, I do not tone it down at all. And everybody who works in my office and everybody who's in the industry that I've collaborated with, I think they know the same. I'm extremely, extremely proud of where I come from. And I will speak in Spanish during the day. I'll have calls in Spanish with clients that don't speak English. And I'm very vocal about my desire to help the next generation of Latinos that don't necessarily have the guidance in education and um, don't have the knowledge of what commercial real estate is. But uh, no, I, I don't tone it down. I think that's a great example of using your background rather than trying to conform to whatever box people perceive you uh, to want to be in. Uh, you thrive by being you, and that's a terrific story. But I think you also asked a question, and I'm going to turn this one to Armando. Has that changed? Is that a new thing in the workplace? Because Armando, you've obviously been in the workplace longer. Did you ever have a different way of approaching your background in the workplace? Did you ever tone it down? No, I, I don't think so. And and I, I, I take an old expression that I got from my father, which was, uh, and I'm sure it can be translated different ways, but it's no te rajas, which means basically don't back down. And it's always been my approach, even as a runner, when you're running cross countries, like, you know, the, the worst thing you can do is just, oh, I feel tired. You know, it's it's more about taking on more. And I think that sort of approach that I got from my father was how I approached real estate. And it didn't change from early on is, you know, don't back down, always trying to look for yes. And that's part of the key of being a broker is, you know, when you saw a deal, how do you make that thing happen? I've always tried to carry myself in a, in a very confident uh, manner as much as I can, very present, you know, and I, and I get this from my mother and my brother. My mother, um, as, as Nelly said with her parents, despite you know, language barriers and some impediments, she was a salesperson. And despite that language barrier, my mom could you know, sell water to a well. She just did it so well. She did it confidently and she did it uh, with, with a very strong presence. And my brother, actually, even though he's younger than me, he studied theater. And when I would go see him in plays, one thing that I learned from him early on is he would project his presence. He would talk loudly. He would have a high chest. And I always found that extremely, extremely impressive. Um, and, and to be able to do it in front of masses, that was uh, just always so impressive to me. And I always try to emulate that. Another question came in, I'm just going to paraphrase it. Uh, it. It really comes down to real or perceived discrimination that you may or may not have faced in the workplace. Maybe we'll start with you, Nelly. Any point of view on that? I can't name a time that I've felt that way in the last four years that I've been here. Uh, definitely growing up and in different circumstances, but I just find that the people that I work with and um, just where we are in the world today and this nation today, and California specifically being such a diverse and has a very high population of Hispanic people, um, we're very sensitive to that, very respectful more than anything. And that's how we should be treated with maximum respect and equality. Fortunately, I've been surrounded by good, uh, good people, at least uh, um, you know, in the last 10 years. And I've been in, you know, through my capacity, I've been in dozens of meetings where I am the only Hispanic in, in, a, in a meeting of, of 30, right? Or, or we're visiting a market tour and, and I'm, I'm not the only Hispanic or, or where, where people don't know how to pronounce my name. They say something way out of whack, right? Um, I've been in situations where there's two Hispanics in the room and they get our names mixed up, right? I've had experiences where it's been apparent that I'm the only Hispanic, but I've never experienced any type of prejudice directly. Luckily, unfortunately, have not. 
Uh, but if I were to, I would diffuse the situation as quickly. I could walk away from it and then just let my work speak for itself. Armando, any different perspective? No, I, I think it's similar along those lines. I do recall being called, uh, there was a, uh, a Hispanic person in my office prior to my arrival, and his name was Fernando. So I was Fernando for at least a good, you know, two years. So <laughs> I understood that issue. But for me, where I went to high school, I went to college, I always joke around that there were three Latinos in our high school out of, you know, 4,000 students. And it was my sister, my brother, and myself. So I definitely had a slightly different experience in trying to assimilate and work with others. So we got another question. And thank you, uh, Enrique Garcia in New Orleans for this question. Uh, the question Uh, My team, PJM Project Management, works remotely. Hence, we don't have an office in New Orleans, which has made mentor and training challenging. So we're talking a lot about mentoring. We're talking a lot about helping others. But what do you do if you're not face-to-face? And we certainly dealt with that. And quite candidly, all four of us are sitting in different places as we do this podcast. So, uh, Nelly, what's been your experience and what advice would you give on how to mentor, train, work with others remotely? Great question. Uh, well, first of all, I would try to determine where they are geographically, because if, if they are close by and they are willing to meet outside of the office or outside of the home office, then why not get together and go do a lunch or go do a happy hour? Um, why not try to do some kind of team building activity outside of the office? Now, if that's not possible, create team building activities. Don't just have a Zoom call to discuss only business points and business matters. Have a Zoom call to get to know each other, to ask each other questions and do some kind of team building activity and have those on a regular basis. Because I think those types of activities, they probably fall off the radar. You do them once a quarter, once a year, but you're not necessarily collaborating with your team. So make it a weekly activity to have a 15 minute catch up call with each of those uh, individuals and maybe a 30 minute group chat weekly, uh, even monthly if, if time permits. But again, it's just about taking the initiative to get everyone together because they will find the value in that so much after they have those interactions with you. I've tried to keep contact and I did a better job at it early on. When I moved to San Antonio, one of my mentors was in El Paso. And obviously distance was a factor there. We couldn't do face-to-face, but we kept recurring sort of call. We would you know call each other, have conversations, things of that sort. So you could do that. But even when in person, right? Well, first of all, I should say you can have more than one mentor, right? It doesn't have to be just one, someone that's away. So when I found a second mentor in San Antonio, it doesn't have to be in a formal physical setting. Sometimes we would go to lunch, right? And we would have conversations. Sometimes we would go tour a building and something to that effect. It doesn't have to be like, hey, can you give me one hour of your time in the office, we can talk. I mean, yeah, we would do that often as well, but it doesn't have to be in a structured physical office setting. I mean, mentoring, um, learning can take place virtually anywhere. So uh, since the title of today's episode is Generations in the Workplace, I'm not going to suggest for a moment, uh, Armando, that I am less technologically savvy than other generations, but every time something goes wrong in my house, I bring in my 17-year-old son because I have not a chance of doing anything technologically uh, at all complex in my house. Uh, But nevertheless, Armando, from a uh, more experienced generation that didn't grow up with this technology, what's your advice to people dealing with remote work? It's really finding something that you're, like, say, like you're reaching out to your 17-year-old, right? So he's your expert. So I, I would put that same thing on real estate. If there's something you're trying to learn, Maybe it's uh, you want to be the best at Excel or maybe you want to be the best at understanding real estate taxes or 1031 exchange. Whatever sort of skill set you want to achieve, look for that expert and see if that person is willing to engage you. Because I think that's a, one, you get the skill and second, you develop that relationship. And I think that's important going further because some of those simple questions I was asking 20 years ago, how to run a, you know, a net present value calculation, you know, that turned into a relationship now that, you know, it's, it's free flowing. We're friends and we talk about movies instead of MPVs. What is the most misunderstood thing? And we'll start this question with you, Armando, uh, about people in your stage of the career. There are people that have different perceptions of people at different stages of their career. Are there any misperceptions that people have had about you or your stage of your career, given where you are, Armando? 
I would go back to what I had stated earlier, and, and, and that's about wisdom and contacts, right? And, that, and that's where you look at the older generation and know that they've been there for a reason and they've had a volatile experience. And that that is valuable to anyone who's going through the career. So you can avoid those potholes as you advance. Now, I feel like I need to step up and, and speak for my comrades. Obviously, I'm a mid-career millennial, right? And millennials have long had, you know, a misconception of being entitled and maybe sometimes lazy, et cetera. And Spencer, you've done tremendous research on this as well. And I agree with you, what you've said in the past, right, that we're just young adults that have been conditioned differently, right? We've been put through six recessions, three of the worst since the Great Depression. So we've had to reset a couple of times. We've had to delay household formation, but we're getting there. We're learning how to be adults. You know, we like to wear comfortable shoes to work. And sure, sometimes we wear our headphones when we, you know, work from the office. We're probably listening to the Weekly Take podcast, but we'll gladly take them out and have conversations, right? We're just misunderstood. We're just young adults. And we're, we're learning. We're learning from everybody. We're learning from you. Uh, mine has to be very similar to Pedro's. I think that we have um, similar perceptions but one of the other things that I would mention would be that those that are perhaps in the first five years uh, of our careers, we can juggle lots of responsibilities and uh, we do have the capabilities of doing that. However, in, in most cases, and, and as a broker specifically, clients or whoever, your team, they might defer to the person who has 20 years of experience over your opinion. Um, so what I would suggest to those that are in their first five careers is to speak up and share your ideas because no matter what, they're going to be received and they're going to be thought over and somebody's going to say, oh, wow, that's a great idea. Come sit in on this meeting. Or, hey, I would love for you to present and speak about this. So that would be the one thing that I think that uh, is misunderstood about our generation is that we are capable. Um, we can take the reins on projects and show that we have the potential to be that executive vice president or that vice chairman in the next several years. Well, I, I, I agree with all of that. And I'll give you one example. When I was in Mexico City, I was pitching for the sale leaseback of a billion dollars of real estate. And we really, really wanted to win. And we had a team from Spain. We had a team from Mexico City in the pitch. And we determined that the best way to win that particular pitch was two material differences with an American pitch. Number one, we determined it was best to do it in Spanish, um, which is great, except I don't speak Spanish. So we brought in a interpreter from the United Nations who put an earpiece in my ear and everybody else's and we insisted on that through the whole pitch. Part A. Part B, there was a level of respect that we showed to our client that was a little bit different than we showed in the US. In the US, people tend to be a little bit more casual. Well, they will all sit at the table together. There, we insisted that everybody who spoke stood up and then sat down when they stopped speaking as a sign of respect. Guess what? We won. And so thinking about these things, not only in the confines of what is the experience here in the U.S. and thinking about it, well, maybe it's a little different outside, helped win that pitch, too. So I think that uh, that's something to be considered. So, Armando, would like your perspective on the same thing. Well, I actually I had written down as one of my notes is a key word and you just hit it. It's nuances. It's understanding those nuances that it makes all the difference, understanding the difference between you know, I, I think I've seen people like uh, ask questions about Hispanics versus Latin and, and Latinx and those kind of terms. I, I think that's all part of the nuance of the language. And obviously having Latinos involved helps guide you through it. And obviously you've had some good folks guide you through your presentation. Sure. And I, and I mentioned in that particular speech, and it, by the way, we have probably three questions on this in the chat room. And thank you for all uh, who put it, which is uh, the use of Spanish uh, in uh, Nelly talked about doing it in the office. I talked about doing it in a pitch. Um, when do you do it? When shouldn't you do it? What is the right context? Any perspective you might give there, Armando? You got to know your audience and that's what's key. And, um, and understand their sensitivity to it because the majority of the Latinos in the United States are born here in the United States. That usually means sometimes they like their presentations in Spanish. Sometimes they like it in English. So it's best to understand that. I agree with that. Understanding your, your audience is, is important. And as I mentioned early in my career, I would leverage my bilingual status you know, pretty early on. I would work with our folks in you know, CBRE, Mexico, and Latin American teams. And that helped propel me to a, a larger spotlight and think you know, highly or think you know, more institutionally. Just one thing that I would note is uh, I, I can really only speak Spanish with a handful of folks. 
that I know are Spanish speakers because same with Armando. Um, my siblings and I were the only uh, Hispanics at our school growing up in the Sacramento region. It's a little bit of a smaller market, but in the brokerage industry specifically, I, I can easily say I am the only Latina broker in the entire Sacramento region. Um, so really speaking Spanish, I, I embrace it because I don't really get to do that with anyone else around here. I like to say it's loud and proud, um, but I take every opportunity I can to show my culture to everyone and um, to share that with everyone. So that's my perspective on that. That's great. So we could speak for hours because this is awesome. But I'm going to ask everybody now for their final thoughts, starting uh, with you, Pedro. Final thoughts that you'd share with folks about different generations of workers in the workplace and advice you'd give them. I think if there's something that I'd like to leave this audience with and something that I've been grownly being more passionate about is diversity, right? DEI, you know, right? Being, um, you know, diverse and inclusive and just overall diversity strengthens our industry, right? It makes us more innovative. It allows us to see the world from multiple different scopes, not just one. So it makes us more innovative and, and more opportune investors. And commitment starts from the top down. You need to have, you know, structured values, you have good framework governance, and measurable goals. I'm really passionate about that. I'm, I'm excited to see where the industry is moving and some of the efforts that we're personally, as a firm, investing in as well. Very promising, and that's very exciting. Terrific. Uh, Armando, uh, any final thoughts? Yeah, as the Hispanic population continues to grow, we make up about 20% of the U.S. population. We got the strongholds in, in Los Angeles, New York, Houston, Miami, and Dallas, but the places that Hispanics are growing is like D.C., Orlando, Tampa, Philly. To me, that just means in terms of real estate, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity here for Latinos. All I see is potential for growth. And I think with a company like CB and others out there that are trying to do the same thing, there, there's a lot there for the Hispanic cohort. Nelly, final thoughts. Uh, we are just about out of time, but I'm going to give you the last word. Generations in the workplace uh, and advice you'd give to our listeners. Sure. I completely agree with Armando and Pedro. I think those are great thoughts. Further advice or thoughts about the workplace, I think the office is vital. It's so important to have these social interactions and not only the social interactions, but just the team collaborations. Build your teams, grow your teams. You can be so much more strategic and successful in that manner because you're able to have these conversations and not try to track people down on the phone three times a day and then never be able to contact them. Um, highly encourage just having a couple of days in the office at least to start just to be able to have that. And for those that are starting out in their careers, like I said from the beginning, don't be afraid. Take the chance. Take the chance on yourself. Take the chance on those that are around you. I'm sure that you're going to find great people to work with. And I thank all the people that uh, my management, my partners, they have been crucial to my success and our team's success and our office's success. So um, that's what I can say about hopefully building the next generation of people that are going to be the future leaders. Well, thank you, Nellie. And I want to acknowledge that several more questions came in late in the game. I got to as many as we could, but uh, we could go on for hours with this wonderful conversation uh, that we just had with Pedro Nino, Vice President of Galarian Partners. Pedro, thank you for joining. Thank you for having me, Spencer. Nellie Cruz, Associate at CBRE. Nellie, terrific job. Thank you. Thank you, Spencer. Thanks, everyone. And then Armando Nunez in New York City, my hometown. Uh, Armando, thank you for joining the show. Very happy to be here and be part of the best weekly take ever. For more on the topics we discussed on our show, please visit our website, cbre.com slash the weekly take. To our panelists, to the members of Ola, and to all of you in our audience, we'd like to say thanks for joining us. Muchas gracias, I should add. We'll be back next week with more perspectives from the world of commercial real estate. For now, don't forget to share this show as well as subscribe, rate, and review us wherever you listen. I'm Spencer Levy. Be smart, be safe, be well. Adios. Adios.